الحمد لله نحمد ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد So last week we began talking about the ruling of the person who leaves the salat and we got about um, halfway through the evidences of the ones who say that not praying um, takes one out of Islam. So we discussed the ayat that are used, or most of the ayat that are used for, for that opinion and a number of a hadith. The last hadith that we stopped at um, was the hadith, I think, that the head of the matter is Islam. Uh, and the, its pillar is the Salat and we talked about that the stronger opinion on the Hadith is that it's weak but there's evidences elsewhere in the Quran and Sunnah that prove each point of that Hadith um, but as a Hadith in and of itself it was weak um, so the next evidence that's used by the ones who say that not praying takes someone out of Islam is a Hadith of Abu Darda radiallahu anhu uh, that he said أوصاني خليلي أبو القاسم صلى الله عليه وسلم بسبع لا تشرك لا تشرك بالله شيئا وإن قطعت وحرقت ولا ولا تترك صلاة مكتوبة متعمدا فمن تركها عمدا فقد برئت منه الذمة أو برئت منه الذمة وذات أبو الدرداء رضي الله عنه said my خليل and the Khalil is the it's the closest type of friend, Abu al Qasim, so referring to the Prophet وسلم, advised me with seven things. And the, so then the first one he mentioned was do not associate anything with Allah, even if you are cut up or burnt, and do not intentionally leave a prescribed salat, because whoever intentionally leaves it, then the protection is removed from him. Um, and then he mentioned five other things. But this is the point of, of this here is the Salat part um, and that's narrated by Ibn Majah and Lalakai and Al Marwazi um, and uh, this uh, uh, and it's his phrasing so it belongs to Al Marwazi um, and some scholars declared this hadith to be Sahih um, uh, and Allahu Alam like if, if there's any dispute about it but some have accepted it as being Sahih and the way that this is used is that um, the Prophet ﷺ in this hadith said, or it is attributed to him that he said to, to not leave a salat, that if whoever leaves a salat intentionally, then the protection is removed from him. Um, so that's the point, that the Muslims have a specific type of protection where their blood is protected regardless, with a few exceptions, um, which we'll get to soon. Um, so the fact that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, removed this protection off of them, then the, the ones who say that not praying would be an act of disbelief, say that this proves it because um, the fact that leaving this removes this protection means that they've actually um, left left Islam. So that's the way that they use that hadith. <coughs> um, another hadith that they use is one from um, Mihjan that he said, or anhu kana fi majlisin ma'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa uzzina bi salatin faqam Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasalla ثم رجع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ومحجن في مجلسه فقال له رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما منعك أن تصلي مع الناس ألست برجل مسلم فقال بلى يا رسول الله ولكني كنت قد صليت في أهلي فقال له إذا جئت فصل مع الناس وإن كنت قد صليت or that محجن narrated that he was sitting with the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and the adhan for the salat was performed. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood up and prayed. Then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came back and Mihjan was still sitting in the same spot. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, What prevented you from praying with the people? Are you not a Muslim man? So he said, Of course, O Messenger of Allah, but I prayed at my home. So he said, If you come, then pray with the people even if you have already prayed. And that's narrated by Imam Malik and Ahmad and al Nasai and Al-Hakim who declared it Sahih. And it was also declared Sahih by um, Al-Albani and um, Al-Arna'ut declared it to be Hassan. Um, so this hadith, um, the way they use this is they say that when the Prophet ﷺ returned and said, what stopped you from, or what prevented you from praying? 
he said, then he said, aren't you a Muslim man? So the assumption here is that the fact that you're Muslim is would mean that you pray, and the fact that the only kind of reason you wouldn't have prayed is that you're not Muslim. So um, this is the way that they use this hadith as evidence for that opinion as well. Um, the next hadith that they use is from Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, um, that he that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "In Hawdi abadu min ayla min adan." لَهُ أَشَدُّ بَيَاضًا مِنَ الثَّلْجِ وَأَحْلَى مِنَ الْعَسِلِ بِاللَّبَنِ وَلَآنِيَتَهُ أَكْثَرُ عَدَدًا أَكْثَرُ مِنْ عَدَدِ النُّجُومِ وَإِنِّي لَأَصُدُّ النَّاسَ عَنْهُ كَمَا يَصُدُّ الرَّجُلِ إِبَلَ النَّاسِ عَنْ حَوْضِهِ فَقَالُوا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَتَعْرِفُنَا يَوْمَئِذٍ قَالَ نَعَمْ لَكُمْ سِيمَا لَسْتَ لِأَحَدٍ مِنَ الْأُمَمِ مِنَ الْأُمَمِ تَرِدُونَ عَلَيَّ غُرًّا مُحَجِّلِينَ مِنْ أَثَرِ الْوُضُوءِ or that Abu Huraira anhu narrated that the Prophet وسلم, said, um, My hawd or my, um, my pond, so the pond on the Day of Judgment that the Muslimin will drink from um, to quench their thirst, he said it's further or larger than the distance between um, Ayla and Adan. Um, and Ayla is a place in modern day Jordan, and Adan is in Yemen. So that's the, the size of it. He said it's, it's larger than that. And he says it's that it's whiter than snow, and it's sweeter than honey mixed with milk, and the containers that you drink from are more than the number of the stars, and I will drive people away from it, just as a man drives the camels of people away from his water hole. Um, and then they said, O Messenger of Allah, will you know us on that day? Um, and he said, Yes you have a sign or a symbol or a characteristic that none of the other nations will have. You will come pass by me with white faces and limbs due to the result of the wudu. And that hadith is agreed upon. Um, and this is one of Imam Muslim's phrasing. So they use this hadith in that we know that only the Muslimin will drink from uh, the hawl on the Day of Judgment. And... The Prophet ﷺ will turn everyone away except for the people that he knows to be from his ummah. And he'll know them to be from his ummah by their sign or the the glowing parts of their face and their limbs that's left behind from the wudu. So if someone doesn't pray, obviously they're not making wudu. And if they're not making wudu, then the Prophet ﷺ won't have any reason to know them on the Day of Judgment and let them drink from their uh, from his held or from his pond. So they would be turned away along with the other people who um, uh, who aren't um, Muslims, whether by default or by apostasy or whatever the case may be. Um, the next hadith that they use is a hadith from Ibn Umar, and there's a number of these hadith with similar phrasing, some from Ibn Umar and some from Abu Huraira and others. But the one I'm mentioning is from Ibn Umar, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أُقَاتِلَ النَّاسِ حَتَّى يَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَيُؤْتُ الزَّكَاةِ فَإِذَا فَعَلُوا ذَلِكَ عَصَمُوا مِنِّي دِمَاءَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ إِلَّا بِحَقِّ الْإِسْلَامِ وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Or that Abdullah bin Umar رضي الله عنهما narrated that the Prophet وسلم, said I was commanded to fight the people until they testify to La ilaha illallah and that um, Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah and they establish the prayer and they pay the zakat then if they do so then they have protected their blood and their wealth from me except what is the right of Islam and their account is with Allah and this hadith is uh, narrated by Al-Bukhari and Muslim and this is one of Imam Al-Bukhari's <coughs> phrasings so this hadith again is another uh, evidence that's used and the way that it's used is that the Prophet wasallam was commanded or states that he was commanded by Allah to fight the people until they do these things. So it wasn't sufficient to just say la ilaha illallah, but the prayer was required as well. So, And we know that the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't fight non-Muslims, or sorry, he wouldn't fight Muslims um, uh, by default. So if there was any fighting between Muslims, it would be for a specific reason to bring them back to the truth. But in this case, he placed these three conditions um, for the person to be Muslim or to enter into Islam um, and one of them was the, was the performing of the Salat. So meaning if the person testified to La ilaha illallah but still didn't pray then the fighting from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have continued. 
Um, so this is the uh, another evidence that they. Um, so they, this is one evidence. They also um, uh, they also mention um, a narration from Abu Sa'id uh, al Khudri, in which um, it's a long hadith. So I'll just mention the relevant part that he mentions that they received some uh, ghana'im or some spoils of war. So the Prophet ﷺ was dividing it amongst the people and what they, what each person deserved from the, um, uh, from from the spoils of war. Um, so then one of the people amongst the, in in the group said, "Kunna nahnu ahqq bihada min haula," or that we were more deserving of this uh, this share than the other people. So then Abu Sa'id continues and says, "Fabalagha dalik al Nabiya sallallahu alaihi wasallam, faqal ala ta'manuni." وَأَنَا أَمِينُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ تَأْتِينِي خَبَرُ السَّمَاءِ صَبَاحًا وَمَسَاءً Or that, 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 that news reached the Prophet ﷺ that someone said, we're more, more deserving of this than, than the other people. So the Prophet ﷺ said, don't you trust me while I'm the trusted one of, uh, who, I am the trusted one of the one who is over the heavens. The news of the heavens comes to me in the morning and the evening. So meaning like, you're not trusting me, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trusting me with his message. So he said, فَقَامَ رَجُلٌ غَائِرُ الْعَيْنَيْنِ مُشْرِفُ الْوَجْنَتَيْنِ نَاشِزُ الْجَبْهَ كَثُ الْلَحْيَ مَحْلُوقَ الرَّأْسِ مُشَمِّرُ الْإِزَارِ فَقَالْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ اتَّقِ اللَّهِ Or that a man then stood up um, who had sunken eyes, raised cheekbones, a raised forehead and a thick beard and a shaved head um, and his waist wrap was tucked um, up uh, this, so this person stood up and said, O Messenger of Allah, fear Allah. Um, so the Prophet ﷺ said, وَيْلَكَ أَوَلَسْتُ أَحَقُّ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ أَنْ يَتَّقِيَ اللَّهِ قَالْ ثُمَّ وَلَّ الرَّجُلْ قَالْ خَالِدْ خالد إِبْنُ الْوَلِيدِ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَلَا أَضْرِبُ عُنُقَهِ قَالْ لَا لَعَلَّهُ أَنْ يَكُونِ يَصَلِّي Or that this man said to the Prophet ﷺ, fear Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ, um, said, uh, uh, woe unto you, or you know, take warning. I am. Am I not the most deserving of the people on earth to fear Allah? So then this man turned away and left. So Khalid ibn al Walid said, "O Messenger of Allah, should I not strike his neck?" So the Prophet wasallam said, "No, perhaps he prays." Um, uh, and this hadith is agreed upon, and this is one of Al Bukhari's phrasings. So this hadith, um, the. The, the way that it's used for evidence is that the Prophet ﷺ, when, when Khalid ibn al-Walid asked, this, asked the Prophet ﷺ if he should, if essentially if he should kill him for what he said, he said, no, perhaps he prays. So he, he placed the salat here as a means that protects the person's um, uh, life and that, um, you know, if it wasn't for the salat, this person would have had his blood would have been permitted. Um, meaning, so he wouldn't have had any protection, but this salat uh, protected him um, in this situation. Um, so this hadith, like I said, is also authentic. It's all, it's narrated by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And then they also mention another hadith from Abu Hurairah, radiallahu anhu, anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uthiya bimukhannath qad khadiba yadayhi wa rajlayhi bilhinna, فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ما بال هذا فقيل يا رسول الله يتشبه بالنساء فأمر به فنفي إلى البق إلى النقيع فقالوا يا رسول الله ألا نقتله قال إني نهيت عن قتل المصلين وذات أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه narrated that the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was brought a muhannath um, or an effeminate man or a man who um, acts like a woman who had dyed his hands and his feet with, with hinna. Um, so they said, O Messenger of Allah, or so the Prophet ﷺ said, What is wrong with this person? So they said, O Messenger of Allah, he is imitating women. So he commanded that he be banished to an naqir And an naqir is a place um, outside of al Medina. So they said, O Messenger of Allah, should we not kill him? So the Prophet ﷺ said, I was forbidden from killing those who perform the salat. Um, and this hadith is narrated by uh, Abu Dawood and al Daraqutni and al Marwazi. Um, and uh, they, uh, it's, been, it's been authenticated by some scholars. Some, some have authenticated the whole story. Some have authenticated just the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, I was forbidden 
from killing those who perform the Salat. Um, and some declare that the whole thing is weak. So including the story and the statement. Allahu alam, the stronger opinion from a hadith point of view is that the whole thing is weak, including the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu um, But even, even with it being weak, we have the, the hadith of Abu Sa'id that was just before it about the man who said, fear Allah to the Prophet Sallallahu And then he said in the end, no, perhaps he prays. Um, so essentially that indicates the same thing. Yeah. Is that, is that one of the hadith uh, those people that think they could murja uh, style? Like that's what they say you can put the. Which I mean, I should have done them after the answer. I can't pull some points. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, and then the evidence that, that these hadith would be evidence for. Um, the you know the disbelief of the one who doesn't pray is there's a hadith from Abdullah bin Mas'ud um, and there's narrations from Uthman and some other Sahaba that the Prophet Sallallahu said لا يحل دم دم امرئ مسلم يشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأني رسول الله إلا بإحدى ثلاث الثيب الزاني والنفس بالنفس والتارك لدينه المفارق للجماعة or that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, the blood of a Muslim person who testifies to La ilaha illallah and that I am the Messenger of Allah is not permitted except with one of three things. And then he said, Athayyib was zani, so meaning the person who's been married and performs zina, so whether he's married at the time or has been married in the past. When nafsu bin nafs, so meaning a soul for a soul, so meaning if the person kills someone, then he can be killed out of qisas um, as a punishment for the person. And then the third he said, jama'ah," Or the one who leaves his religion and leaves the jama'ah. Um, or, uh, who, yeah, so meaning, we know that the Prophet ﷺ, in, these, in the, all of these ahadith that we mentioned so far, stated that the person who prays can't be killed. So meaning if he didn't pray, he would have been permitted or the Prophet ﷺ would have had him executed. So if we look at this hadith that, that mentions the things where it would be permitted, there's three. One is that the person is uh, performs zina. And we know that leaving the salat obviously isn't zina, so it wouldn't be that. We know that the Prophet ﷺ per- permitted it in, this, in the situation of someone killing another Muslim. And we know that not praying doesn't fall under that. And the third is that the person leaves their, their religion. So meaning they apostate. So this is the only section where the Salat would fall under that would still fit into this hadith that would explain why the Prophet ﷺ would have had the person um, executed at that, at that point. Um, and then it, it fits with the other hadith that we talked about last week of the disbelief of um, the person who, 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 who doesn't pray. Um, and then if there's any questions so far. Actually, uh, so... It, it explains why, you know, in, in the hadith of Abdullah bin Umar and the hadith of, of uh, Abu Sa'id and, and, and other hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said that he wouldn't execute someone because they prayed or, dis- or, or said that the execution would be permitted if they didn't pray, things like that. The only, the only uh, category that the salat or not praying would fall under is... The, the third one because it's not zina and it's not killing somebody so it falls under the third with the evidence that we mentioned like the hadith of, of uh, that we mentioned last week that the, the covenant that's between us and them is the salat so whoever leaves disbelieves or um, uh, whoever leaves the salat um, uh, uh, has performed kufr or shirk like all of these hadith indicate that it would fall under the third one um, so they mention this hadith. They also mention another one from Um Salama, um, uh, radiAllahu anha, that she said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Satakun umara fatarifun wa tunkirun, faman arif, faman arafa, bari'a, waman ankar salim, walakin man radiya wa tabag, qalu afala nuqatilhum, afala nuqatilhum, qalu la ma sallu." Or that Um Salama narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. There will be emirs that are appointed over you, and you will find them doing good and doing bad. So the one who hates their bad deeds is absolved from blame, and the one who disapproves of their bad deeds is also safe, or is safe. But the one who approves of their bad deeds and imitates or follows um, 
then he's doomed essentially or meaning that he's he's the exception so the people asked O Messenger of Allah should we not fight against them so he replied no as long as they perform the Salat um, and this is narrated by Imam Muslim um, and then in another hadith uh, that, that shows that or that explains why this would be disbelief because we we see here that the Prophet ﷺ forbid us from fighting these, these people or these leaders if they still pray. Um, and in another hadith from Junada ibn Abi Umayyah, who said, دَخَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عُبَادَ إِبْنَ الصَّامِتْ وَهُوْ مَرِيضٌ فَقُلْنَا أَصْلَحَكَ اللَّهِ حَدِّثْ بِحَدِيثٍ يَنْفَعُكَ اللَّهُ بِهِ سَمَعَتُهُ مِنَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ uh, or that Junada ibn Abi Umayyah said, we entered upon or we visited Ubada ibn Samit, who was from the Sahaba, while he was sick. So we said, may Allah make you healthy. Tell us a hadith that will benefit you, which you heard from the Prophet So he said, da'ana nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fabaya'anahu faqal fima akhadha alayna an baya'ana ala sam'i wa ta'a في منشطنا ومكرهنا في وفي عس وعسرنا ويسرنا وأثرة علينا وأن لا ننازع الأمر أهله إلا أن تروا كفرا بواح عندكم فيه من عندكم من الله فيه برهان. Or that عبادة بن الصامت then continued and he said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم called us to give or to pledge allegiance to him and from that which we pledged allegiance to him upon was that we would listen and obey both in the times when we were active and when we were tired, and in times that were easy and difficult, or difficult and easy, um, and that we would be obedient and um, not dispute anything with our ruler or our from the people in charge, unless you saw an open uh, act of disbelief, which you have proof uh, from Allah for it. Um, and that's agreed upon and it's narrated by, or this is one of Al-Bukhari's phrasings. So the point of this hadith is that in the one in one hadith the Prophet ﷺ said or forbid anyone from doing anything against the rulers unless they see an open act of disbelief that they have evidence from Allah for. And in the other hadith he forbid them from going against them and then but then said unless they pray or as long as they pray. So the understanding is that not praying would would fall under the open acts of disbelief that are mentioned um, in the other hadith. Um, so this is the, the way of reconciling between the two or the way that uh, this proves or this is used as evidence. Um, so they use this hadith as well also from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِذَا قَرَأَ أَبْنُ آدَمْ السَّجْدَ فَسَجَدْ فَعْتَزَلَ الشَّيْطَانُ يَبْكِي يَقُولْ يَا وَيْلَهُ وَفِي رواية or in a narration of Abu Quraib يَا وَيْلِي أُمِرَ أَبْنُ آدَمْ بِالسُّجُودِ فَسَجَدْ فَلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ وَأُمِرْتُ بِالسُّجُودِ فَأَبَيْتُ فَلِيَ النَّارِ Or that uh, Abu Hurairah narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, If the son of Adam, so a human being, reads the sajda, or the, an ayah of sajda, and then prostrates, the shaytan withdraws and cries and then says, um, Oh, what destruction, or oh, how destroyed am I? The son of Adam was commanded to prostrate, and then he prostrated, so he receives Jannah, and I was ordered to prostrate, and I refused, so I receive uh, the fire. And that's narrated by Imam Muslim. So the point of this hadith, or the way that it's used, is that we know that Iblis, he, he believed in Allah in the sense that he knew that Allah existed, and he, he accepted that Allah existed, and he um, was even at one point uh, a worshipper of Allah, but when, the, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to prostrate to Adam, he refused and that this became the cause for him leaving Islam and becoming um, in the hellfire and from the imams of kufr. So that he refused Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command or refused to follow it. Um, and if this was the case when it wasn't even praying to Allah, it was performing sujood to Adam out of respect for Adam because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to, if this was the case in this situation, then what would be the case when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the person to pray to Allah and then the person refused? Obviously, that would be much bigger. So the person not praying um, 
would be would fall under you know it would be greater than what Iblis did according to those who use this hadith and again like we talked about last week not every hadith that we use proves the point in the same way um, so someone could say that well no Iblis yes he refused but his refusal was out it wasn't out of laziness it was out of um, uh, conceit or out of pride so yes, the act was the same in that they refused to to follow something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them with, but the intention behind it was different. So, you know, this hadith isn't very strong in proving this point. But again, like I said, I'll mention most of what is used. Um, that way, you know, we're aware of it. So these are the hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Next, we'll move on to the ahadith from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and certain statements in which they uh, said things that would indicate what their opinion was um, on this topic. So the first one that we'll mention is a narration from Hisham ibn Urwa, from his father, so from Urwa, that he said, uh, al Miswar ibn Makhrama akhbarahu annahu dakhla ala Umar ibn al-Khattab min al-layla allati tu'ina fiha فأيقظ عمر للصلاة أو أو لصلاة الصبح فقال عمر نعم ولا حظ في الإسلام لمن ترك الصلاة فصلى عمر وجرحه يثعب دما. Or that Hisham ibn Urwa narrated from his father that Al Miswar ibn Makhrama said uh, we entered upon Umar ibn Khattab رضي الله عنه on the night in which he was stabbed. Um, uh, so Umar was awoken for صلاة الفجر or for صلاة الصبح. So Umar said, yes, so meaning they woke him up and he, telling him about the Salat, and he said, yes, and there's no share in Islam for the one who leaves the Salat. Um, and then Umar prayed while his wound was gushing blood, and that's narrated by Imam Malik and Al-Ajurri and Al-Marwazi and Al-Lalaka'i, um, and it was declared Sahih um, by Shaykh Al-Albani, and it's been accepted, essentially wide, widely spread that it's accepted as being from the Prophet or from Umar ibn Khattab that he said this statement. Um, so he said there's no share in Islam for the one who leaves the Salat. So this indicates that if you have no share, that you're completely out of Islam. It's not that you have, you know, you've lost part of your shares, you know, you're completely have nothing left of Islam. Um, so that's narrated from Umar. Um, and then there's also a narration from uh, one of the tabi'een who was named Abdullah ibn Shaqiq al-Uqayli that indicates that this was the opinion of all of the Sahaba. So the narration is from al-Jurayri from Abdullah ibn Shaqiq al-Uqayli that he said كان أصحاب, أصحاب محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يرون شيئا من الأعمال تركه كفر غير الصلاة or that Abdullah ibn Shaqiq al-Uqayli who was from the tabi'een said that the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't used to view anything from amongst the actions, the abandonment of which would be kufr, except for the salat, um, and that's narrated by uh, Tirmidhi and Al Marwazi, and it was declared sahih by Al Nawawi and Al Iraqi and Al Sakhawi uh, and other scholars. So here we have uh, uh, Abdullah bin Shaqiq saying that the companions of the Prophet sallallahu didn't view anything didn't view the abandonment of anything to be kufr other than um, the salat. So he's attributing it to all of the sahaba. Um, and then there's another narration of this same statement that's attributed to Abu Huraira, um, meaning that Abu Huraira said this statement, uh, and that's narrated by Al-Hakim in Al-Mustadrak, but it's, it's a munkar narration or it's a rejected narration because it's a mistake from one of the narrators that they attributed it to Abu Huraira. So they went further than Abdullah bin Shaqiq. So instead of stopping at Abdullah bin Shaqiq al-Uqayli, they went further and said that it belonged to someone further up in the chain. But the, the correct opinion is that it's a statement of Abdullah bin Shaqiq. So it's, it belongs to um, the tabi'i. Yeah. Okay, my question is, uh, is this true? Because clearly a Mukher, we discussed this. Yeah. A used to do... Um, Leaving the zakah is also kufr. According to yeah, some of the. So you, you mean is which, is which true? Like he, here, uh, Abdullah ibn Shaqiq, he's saying that uh, the Sahaba used to view the abandonment of anything as kufr, except salah. Right. So definitely, we take from this that they they viewed 
leaving the Salat as Kufr. So then there's there's an issue, did they view leaving anything else as Kufr though? Because he's saying that they didn't, but others have claimed that they did. So at that point, there's a number of ways that we could kind of look at that. So one would be that he didn't know that they all took this opinion, or that maybe not all of them took that opinion and there was a dispute amongst the Sahaba as to whether leaving the Zakat was Kufr. Um, so there's a number of ways of, of looking at that. So he's, uh, according to this tabi'in, uh, he is actually talking about an ijma of the Sahaba regarding the Salah. That right. he can conclude. And then the, uh, but he himself is concluding that other things weren't included in it. But then we would have to look at, well, maybe someone else said no, they actually did. And then we would have to say, you know, so again, technically there's two statements in here. One is that leaving the Salat is kufr according to the Sahaba and leaving anything else isn't kufr according to the Sahaba. But the one that we can affirm is, is clear. But then we would have to look, you know, it might turn out that there's other evidence from the Sahaba that they viewed other things. Yeah. Uh, inshallah, we'll get to that like in the, the zakat uh, chapters. Akhi, uh, if I may, you also talked about this topic in your uh, Aqidah lectures, right? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. yeah. Um, and then just to add a, a point about this, some of the modern day people have tried to reject this statement from Abdullah bin Shaqiq al uqaili um, trying to kind of reject the idea that leaving the Salat would be kufr. Um, and they, what they say is that um, the uh, the narrator, or that Al Jurairi, so who's the narrator from Abdullah bin Shaqiq, so from the the second generation after the t- Sahaba, so at Ba'at Tabi'in, that um, they say that he became senile later in his life, and that the narrator from him, we can't confirm that he heard it before he became senile or not. So they say that this is a defect in the Hadith. Um, uh, so we can't accept this consensus of the companions. Um, so there's a, there's a few things to mention about this. So first, um, the narrator from him, Abdul, Abdul A'la, Ibn Abdul A'la, heard from Al-Jurairi before he uh, became senile. Um, and that was mentioned by um, Al-Ijli in his book, uh, Tariq al-Thuqat, that he said that he heard from him before... Uh, before he became senile, eight years. So eight years before he became senile, he heard from al Jurairi. I mean, also we have another narration from Bishr ibn al Mufaddil from al Jurairi. So we have two narrators from this person who became senile. One heard from him before he was uh, became senile by eight years, um, and he was from the most authentic narrators from al Jurairi. And then the second one, who was al Bishr ibn al Mufaddil. Um, also heard from him before that time and that was mentioned by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani in his uh, um, introduction to Fath al-Bari. Um, so he said he heard from him at that, at that point as well. Um, so this is uh, evidence that they use for consensus of the Sahaba. And likewise the statement of, of, of uh, Umar ibn Khattab they use that similarly in that it would be a consensus because we know that Umar ibn Khattab died and many, many of the, of the Sahaba were present with him when he died. And on top of that, the ones who weren't present with him when they died might have been in the city or they might have been close and heard the news and have been told what he said. The fact that we have nothing narrated from any of the Sahaba saying anything to him like, you know, you know when he said, the person who doesn't pray has no share in Islam, no one rejected this from him. No one said, no, that's wrong. No one said they disagreed or anything like that. So if we had many Sahaba with him when he said it, others were in the city, others were, you know, would have heard the news as well. And we don't have anything from any of them saying, you know, up until all the Sahaba were gone, we know he died very early on after the Prophet ﷺ's death. We know that after him there was Uthman and then Ali, and we know there was Muawiyah, and we know there was um, other Sahaba who took the Khilafah as well then, you know, the fact that the Sahaba were along for, around for so much longer and ha- had heard this news and no one said anything, um, that this can be also used as uh, evidence that um, it was a consensus. Um, another evidence that they use is a hadith from Abu Umam al-Bahili that the Prophet Sallallahu said, لَتُنْقَضَنَّ عُرَى الْإِسْلَامِ عُرْوَةً عُرْوَةً فَكُلَّمَا إِنْقَضَتْ عُرْوَةً تَشَبَّتَ النَّاسُ بِبِلَّةِ تَلِيهَا uh, or that uh, the Prophet ﷺ said 
the knots of Islam will be undone one at a time. So whenever a knot is undone, the people will cling to the one that is after it. And the first of these that will be undone is the ruling or the hukum or the authority. And the last of them will be the salat. And that's narrated by Ahmed and others and it was declared sahih by Al-Busiri um, and others. So this hadith, what they use is they say that if the knots of Islam will be undone and the last thing to be undone will be the salat, so after the salat is gone, there's nothing left. So um, again, like I just mentioned, you know, not every hadith clearly proves this point. This hadith, it would be easy for someone to say, well, no, this isn't talking about an individual. It's talking about um, chronologically from the time of the Prophet wasallam until Islam is no longer present, that the, the last thing that will, will be to go, uh, that, or the last thing that will, that will go from Islam will be the Salat. And after that, nothing will be left. So this isn't really a clear evidence um, for the point. But again, some have used this as being uh, evidence. Um, and again, that hadith is narrated by Ahmed. Uh, yeah, and also Sheikh Abdullah Sa'ad, who's from a, a contemporary scholar, declared it to be Hassan. And also there's a narration from Hudayfa, who was from the companions that he said, or that he saw, uh, or that, sorry, from Zayd ibn Wahab, who said, رَأَى حُذَيْفَ رَجُلًا لَا يُتِمَّ الرَّكُوعِ وَالسُّجُودِ قَالْ مَا صَلَّيْتْ وَلَوْ مِتَّ وَلَوْ مُتَّ مُتَّ عَلَى غَيْرِ الْفِطْرَةِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ اللَّهُ مُحَمَّدًا صلى الله عليه وسلم عليها Or that Hudayfa saw a man praying and he wasn't doing his ruku' and sujood correctly. So Hudayfa said to him, you haven't prayed. So meaning because your, your salat was invalid, because you weren't, you weren't doing them even in an acceptable manner. So then he said, and it, so you haven't prayed, and if you were to die, then you would die upon something other than the fitrah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which Allah um, placed him upon. So meaning you would have died upon an, a religion other than the religion of Islam. Um, and that's narrated by Al-Bukhari in his Sahih. And then there's a narration from uh, Abu Darda that he said, لا إيمان لمن لا صلاة له وَلَا صَلَاةَ لِمَنْ لَا وُضُوءَ لَهُ Or that Abu Darda from the companion said, there's no um, iman or there's no faith for someone who doesn't have salat and there's no salat for someone who doesn't have wudu. Um, uh, and that's narrated by Lalaka'i and Al-Marwazi and it was declared um, sahih by Al-Albani. Um, so this hadith here, we, Abu, uh, Abu Darda is saying that there's no iman, so meaning no Islam for the one who doesn't pray. And then he's continue to show kind of the relationship of those two by saying that there's just as there's no salat for the one who doesn't have wudu. So we know that the wudu is invalid, or sorry, the salat is invalid without wudu. So likewise, the Islam would be invalid without the um, salat. And then also a narration from um, uh, Mujahid ibn Abil Hajjaj or Mujahid Abil Hajjaj from Jabir ibn Abdullah that he said, um, or he said, قُلْتُ لَهُ مَا كَانَ يُفْرَقُ وَمَا كَانَ يُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ الْكُفْرِ وَالْإِيمَانِ عَنْدَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ عَلَى عَهْدِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الصلاة Or Mujahid Abu al-Hajjaj uh, said that he asked Jabir ibn Abdullah, and Jabir ibn Abdullah is a companion. He said, during the time of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم, what actions used to differentiate between kufr and iman? So he said the salat. Um, and that was narrated by Al-Marwazi and Al-Khalal and others. And um, it's uh, Shaykh Abdullah Sa'ad said it's Hassan la ba'sa bih, or that it's Hassan and no problem um, with it. Uh, so again here, Jabir ibn Abdullah is saying that in the time of the Prophet Wasallam, the thing that would differentiate between kufr and iman um, was uh, the salat. Um, and then there's also a narration from him as well uh, that's an authentic one from him that uh, um, someone said to Jabir, Akuntum ta'addun al dhanb fikum shirkan? Qala la, qal wa su'ila ma bayn al abdi wa bayn al kufr, qala tark al salah. Or that Abu Zubair said that he heard Jabir ibn Abdullah being asked. Um, did you used to consider sins to be kufr? 
uh, or shirk, sorry, and he said no. So then they said, um, what was between the slave, so meaning a human being, and kufr, so he said the abandonment of the salat. Um, and that's narrated by Muhammad ibn Nasr al-Marwazi, and it's authentic. And then also, so we're almost done, the evidences for this opinion, a narration from Al-Hasan, so Al-Hasan from the Tabi'een, Al-Hasan al-Basri, that he said, بَلَغَنِي أَنَّ أَصْحَابَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ كَانُوا يَقُولُونَ بَيْنَ الْعَبْدِ وَبَيْنَ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ فَيَكْفُرْ أَنْ يَدَعَ الصَّلَاهِ مِنْ غَيْرِ عُذْرِ Or that, uh, that Awf narrated from Al-Hasan al-Basri that he said, it has reached me that the companions of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم used to say, between the slave and him falling into shirk and then disbelieving is that he abandons the salat without an excuse. And that's narrated by uh, Al-Lalaka'i and Al-Khallal and uh, Ibn Batta. Um, and Shaykh Abdullah Sa'ad said that it's authentic. Um, so there's this and then the... I think we're almost done. Actually, isn't uh, this last hadith in Tadlis form? How come? It has reached me from... Well, from the companions, right? He met, he met companions. Okay. So Hassan met like a number of companions um, of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he's saying like what it, what 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 has reached him from these companions is that um, this is what they used to say. So some of it might have heard directly. Some of it might have been that they told him what they used to think. And again, you know, someone could argue against this by saying. Um, uh, you know, they might say that it's from Al Hassan, and he's not clearly stating. But you know, if if he was attributing it to the Prophet Sallallahu or to a specific companion that he didn't meet, okay. then definitely there would be. But for him to say, "This is what's reached me from the companions," and he's from the generation that met the companions, then Allahu Alam, like there's there's some pretty pretty good strength to that. Okay. Um, and then also from Hamad ibn Zaid from Ayyub al Sakhtayani who was from the Tabi'een, that he said, Tark salati kufr la, la, la yukhtalafu fih, or that Ayyub al-Sakhtayani from the Tabi'een said, leaving the salat is disbelief, which is not disputed. Um, so they use this, um, and then they mention a, a weak narration from Ibn Abbas, uh, which he uh, mentioned the salat and the hajj and the fasting as being disbelief, but it's weak. Um, and inshallah, that's the end of the evidences for the opinion that it's disbelief. So next week, inshallah, we'll get into the evidences that of the ones who say that it's not disbelief, and then we'll talk about some of the um, refutations of each side against the others, or what they say about the other evidences, because each side has their own ways of saying, well, yes, we accept these ayat and hadith, but they don't indicate this because of this, this, and this. Um, so inshallah we'll get into that uh, afterwards. Uh,